Okay. Um, I think it's time for us to start. My name is Ray Dolan, um, and I'm delighted to chair this meeting. Um, this particular meeting was sort of set up in discussion with SE, mainly to highlight aspects of cognitive neuroscience stroke computational psychiatry. And uh, we have three speakers. I'm going to just give very brief introductions. The speakers will speak for roughly about 12 minutes. Uh, then there'll be a general discussion chaired by Gemma Lewis. Um, so without further ado, I think we have our first speaker on the line. Uh, it's Dr. Tobias Hauser. Tobias works at the Max Planck Center for Computational Psychiatry and Aging at UCL. He is a PI at the Wellcome Center and is holder of a Sir Henry Dale Fellowship. So his title is there. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tobias. Thanks, Ray. Um, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me and see my slides well. Um, Yes, so um, I'm very happy to uh, present um, here in, in this Catalyst seminar, which I've been following since the beginning, and I think um, is a really excellent opportunity for UCL to really bring together people from different angles and standpoints. And um, Ray asked me to talk more conceptually um, about computational psychiatry, and so I decided to Kind of give a slightly different talk than I usually give, more kind of almost a bit of a meta talk, um, where I will give you three statements, um, let's say, that I think are driving or should be driving our approaches towards understanding mental ill health. And based on that, I will um, speculate or discuss um, how we can use these statements or these lemmas to influence um, and, and drive our research um, to better understand mental health. And I hope it will be um, become a bit clear um, what I mean by that um, as we go along. Um, yes. So I think a lot of stuff that drive a lot of a lot of beliefs that drive us in our research and, and that are underlying computational psychiatrists, but also all other fields are often like very implicit. And, and my hope is to make it slightly more explicit so that we can actually discuss that. And I think that might be a good starting point for discussion. So the first one um, that, that most of us are um, believing is that probably that we don't really know the etiology that underlie psychiatric disorders. And what I mean by that is that over the last 100 plus years, we've come up with a um, great classification system for symptoms like the ICD-10, but these are very descriptive symptom levels descriptions, um, whereas the etiologies of the biological mechanisms that, that underlie these mental health illnesses are not really captured, and we still don't know that. And that has several consequences um, on the one hand, it is very difficult to um, classify or detect something when you're not unsure about the label, but also that there is probably a quite a big heterogeneity within the samples that we're looking at, within the things that we classify as, let's say, depression. The other statement um, that is definitely the case for people that come from cognitive neuroscience is that we believe that psychiatric illnesses are disorders of the mind and brain. So they are driven by neurocognitive impairment. And this uh, simply comes out of the belief that the things that we are experiencing, the, the um, ego that we are experiencing and the disturbances are all, all determined by brain function or brain ill function. And so it's important that we focus on the brain to understand the mechanisms um, and, and the theology of mental health disorders. And the last point, which I think uh, in this Catholic catalyst um, environment, I don't really have to stress, is that um, development is a critical factor for understanding mental ill health. And that is something that um, we probably all know, but it's, which is often neglected, especially in cognitive neuroscience, namely that 
there is specific time courses for disorders about when they emerge. And then especially adolescence um, is a particularly vulnerable period um, and, and dry, and, and that's when most psychiatric disorders emerge. And the problem with that is that traditionally in, in cognitive neuroscience, we use adult patients, which have been suffering for years and years, um, but we are neglecting this important information of, um, of, of uh, time, of age, of development um, that will inform us and probably is very critical if you want to understand the etiology, so the mechanisms that are driving the emergence. And we know um, that almost three quarters of all um, psychiatric illnesses arise before adulthood, um, and we really need to focus on this period. And so with having these three statements, we can um, draw a few conclusions or uh, they have a, a bunch of implications um, for our research that to guide our research um, and, and finding ways how to, we can bring these together. So one is that if we believe that psychiatric illnesses arise from disorders of the mind and brain, then that means we probably should study the mind and brain. The third statement that adolescence is important means that we should probably study development, that we should see how um, people transition into illness and see what is going on in the brain, how does that change and how does a um, healthy development of the brain differ from a development of the brain that then leads to illness. And we know by now very much about brain development during childhood and adolescence, and we know that it is changing all over. But if we really want to understand what are these trajectories that lead into impairment, we actually need to take a slightly different, we need to embed this approach into our um, studies to, to tackle mental health. So we need to look at um, the brain development as it on, is ongoing in longitudinal ways and uh, to look at where does it start differing in their development. And we have um, a lot of uh, macrostructural studies looking at brain development showing lots of different um, developments in gray and white matter, but what we often lack is uh, looking at a more of micro scale level to look more at the, um, to get a better idea about the, the mechanisms such as the synaptic pruning of myelination, so really on the cellular level to understand what is going on. And in a study where um, I was involved with a couple of years ago, the NSPN study, we actually, um, if, try to address this in a longitudinal cohort-based studies of adolescents where we had over 300 people, um, adolescents come in for over a year um, and we um, acquired myelin sensitive maps so we can get better into um, the microstructural properties of myelination. And what we saw there is really that um, impulsivity but also compulsivity was related to this adolescent brain development and in particular in, in impulsive subjects we saw a reduc reduced uh, myelin growth in the inferior frontal gyrus which is often uh, linked to um, disorders of impulsivity and importantly we saw that there was a dynamic interaction meaning that those people that showed the least myelin growth in this area were the ones that became more impulsive over the time of the study. And this means really that, um, that there is a, a relationship between brain development and um, a development of symptoms. And by looking at the longitudinal aspect of development, we can actually get at this. However, these approaches have some limitations because we are just looking at impulsivity here in a, in a very broad questionnaire, which is probably very not reflective of what is going on in the brain. And this is a, a key cha, um, problem that we are struggling with, which is we have these very abstract clinical interview-based diagnoses on the one hand, and this very complex integrate thing, which is called the brain on the other hand. And to bridge the gap between these two is actually a major challenge because the brain is probably not adhering to what we then on a very abstract level call a specific symptom. 
And this is particularly the case if we believe that a certain symptom might not just arrive due to one um, information processing impairment, but could arise due to lots of different impairments. And so in a reminder, I will tell you about how we can maybe use computational, what I call computational symptoms, to try, try and bridge the gaps, to, to be more relatable um, to the brain, but then also be translatable to the uh, symptoms that we assess clinically. And I will just focus on one example. We have a bunch of different ones, uh, which is indecisiveness, which is a, a general trait, which is often found in OCD, but also in other disorders, um, which is just signified by people having difficulties making decisions, and that's how we assess it. We ask them in clinical interviews, how difficult is it for you to make a decision? However, to understand the mechanisms, we um, developed a task, an information gathering task, which allowed us to capture this indecisiveness by means of a behavioral um, readout, which is how many cards they open in a certain game. And we could show that this, is, uh, this indecisiveness measure is not only different in OCD patients compared to the controls, but it actually is nicely correlated here um, with the interview-based measure um, here on the x-axis, showing some ecological validity, showing that we can actually capture a similar phenomenon um, by using task-based measures. The advantage of these task-based measures is then to, that we can use computational models, which we are known are at least partially implemented in the brain, and we can tease apart which aspects of our cognition or, or of the information processing might be changed, um, which gives us better ideas of where we could actually um, look at in the brain and, and understand why this is arising. And we can then use these approaches to start addressing um, the other points, the other statements I brought in the beginning. So for example, we can look at the development and we, can, and we saw that there is dramatic changes in this indecisiveness based measure throughout development. And there seems to be the major change um, at the onset of adolescence, which is exactly when uh, many OCD um, cases arise. So there might be a relationship between brain development or at least cognitive development and the rising of OCD symptoms. And we can then also go and look deeper into the brain. We can, for example, look at which neurotransmitters are involved and we can see how different neurotransmitters affect different aspects of cognition and of indecisiveness. But we can also look at um, neuroimaging to, to pinpoint the exact brain areas that are involved in computing these um, cognitive aspects. So now I've laid out a few aspects of how we can bring together these different um, points or lemmas. Um, so by focusing on development, by using novel tasks and maybe computational measures that can uh, maybe relate more directly to the brain rather than the abstract symptoms. But one of the challenges still is that if we go after the symptoms, if we go after the disorders, there is a huge heterogeneity, which means that we need to start teasing apart um, different subclasses. And for that, we really need to be, have big samples. And to do that, um, we, we are very limited in our lab-based um, in our lab based studies just because of limited n numbers of subjects. So what we did is we uh, decided to go into a completely di different direction and we developed a smartphone app where we gamified um, the indecisiveness task, but also a bunch of others um, and were, allowed, uh, were able to really collect data from much larger samples. And so this has been a huge success over um, the last couple of months. We've collected data from thousands of people and you can see they're all over the world. And uh, we can now look at completely different aspects and look at much more intricate details. So we can look at changes and we can see that developmental changes still are there, but they show more interesting patterns. And we can use that to actually look at different clusters. And this we're not only doing using kind of population-based studies, but also we can use that in much more targeted studies looking at clinical changes. And this really gives us the opportunity to um, relate patients and, and to bigger samples. And with this having said, um, I would like to end here and um, 
hand over to Matt, I think. Thanks. Very much, Tobias. Um, so we're not going to have discussion until the very end. So we'll just go straight away to our next speaker, who is Zoe Noh from the uh, Berlin. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. And the Max Planck Center in London is trend with that institute. Uh, Zoe got her PhD from the University in Philadelphia. Uh, where she worked with Nori and Ingrid Olsen on memory development. And today she's going to talk about episodic memory development, something that's hugely important for many, many different aspects of psychopathology, but also uh, as, as we can see from very high profile uh, cases of um, alleged child abuse, etc., hugely important in jurisprudence as well. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Zoe. Thank you, Ray. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to be a part of this um, seminar series. Given the time, my goal for this talk is to give a very broad stroke overview of my research, um, which aims to understand how children develop the necessary building blocks of an adaptive memory. So we're going to go a little bit, uh, not as big picture as uh, Tobias talk, but more domain specific, I would say. Uh, and in particular, I'm really interested in how memory not only allows us to remember the specific events of our past, but it also enables us to extract the commonalities across different experiences which can guide uh, our predictions about possible futures. So I'm going to walk through an example to help illustrate the computational framework that has inspired us into um, in thinking about what these building blocks might look like and how to best measure them in children. Okay, so one of my favorite memories is of the time that I went kayaking with my friend Susan um, at her lake house this a uh, few years back. And I remember kayaking in this wooden boat for many hours that afternoon and the weather was really nice. So all of the characteristics that would render this an episodic memory or a memory of a past episode tied to a rich and detailed context. Now, the ability to access events that collectively make up our past and form our identity like this one is really fundamental to the human experience and well-being. So in order to understand its healthy development, um, one of the questions that we want to ask is, what underlies this episodic memory capacity? Now, one hallmark of this capacity is being able to um, reconstruct a complex episode, episode um, when given a cue, such as being reminded of the lake house would bring back to my mind Susan and the wooden boat. So all of the things that co-occurred in this episode. So that's one piece of the picture. Another crucial ingredient is that I need to preserve the specificity of this experience so I don't confuse it with other similar memories that I have, um, like disting distinguishing this boat from other boats that I've seen or this lake house from other lake houses that I've been to. So that's also another important piece of episodic memory. At the opposite side of all of this, uh, what we also need in order to function adaptively in the world is being able to pick up the regularities across different uh, experiences. So if I didn't only just go kayaking with Susan, there were other times that we went skiing and hiking together. Detecting the com commonalities across these different events, which is that um, Susan is pretty outdoorsy, would help me uh, to generalize that she would also like to go camping, for instance. This is just one simple example of generalization, but it is a key learning me mechanism by which we accumulate and apply our knowledge to new situations in general. Meeting both of these memory needs, generalization and episodic memory is really important. Without one, it's probably really bad news, but they are seemingly at odds with each other, right? In, at least in terms of what they uh, emphasize or downplay. So how do we manage both? Um, a computational model called a complementary learning system theory posits that there is a la labor division between generalization and episodic memory in the brain, which allows us to do both without them necessarily trading off. And in particular, the hippocampus is thought to be very well suited uh, for one-shot learning uh, via processes of pattern completion, 
which aids cue retrieval and pattern separation, which aids memory discrimination. Pattern completion um, is thought to rely at least in part on subfield CA1 and CA3 of the hippocampus, whereas pattern separation primarily relies on the dentatures also within the hippocampus. Meanwhile, we also have a statistical learning in place um, that detects the recurring patterns in our environment, which in turn enables generalization. And the original idea is that the neocortex um, can do generalization over time and over many repetition, but more recent um, revision to this view, as well as empirical data, at least in young adults, points to the interaction between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex as key players in generalization, especially if you think about the generalization that can occur rapidly and on the fly. What we also know is that the hippocampus undergoes a very um, protracted development, fairly protracted development, I should say. Um, but the important thing to note is that the maturational course uh, varies across these different subfields, right? And which are thought to be involved in different things. So what this means is that by measuring the behavioral readouts of these processes, as they're still um, undergoing construction, if you will, would give us a lot of information on one, the propellers of a healthy memory development, and two, um, the precise profile of memory dysfunction we would expect if a certain process were to go awry. So our work has focused on using this framework to guide our experimental design in testing the age patterns in each process, namely pattern completion, pattern separation and generalization as children transition from early to middle childhood. So we're talking about the time when they're going from preschool to primary school. And I think that these are some of the cognitive backbones uh, of learning memory so that, so that they can um, prepare them for um, early formal education. And in some cases, we also look at how brain structure might relate to memory performance in children. Okay, so how do children develop the ability to reconstruct a complex episode from a partial cue? Um, we're talking about really young kids, right? So we actually have to go all out and devise a bunch of very fun, engaging, dynamic animations to get these kids to care. Um, but in short, we showed them events like this, much like Susan with a boat at the lake house, along with other events like Susan in the living room, reading a book, for instance. Then we tested them uh, on their ability, ability to pattern complete uh, by queuing them, queuing Susan and the lake house and see if they could accurately retrieve the boat. And we have repeatedly found this drastic age difference from age four to age six. So we're talking about very, a very tight age window here because the six-year-olds then just perform pretty on par with the young adults, at least in this kind of paradigm. And I also want to point out that this is not really uh, the poor performance in the four-year-olds. It's not really a story about them not remembering the individual items, but it is about them misremembering which association occurred in which context. And we also found that their pattern completion uh, performance relates to individual differences in the, uh, in the coherence of the white matter connectivity that connects the hippocampus uh, to the inferior parietal lobule. And we think that the improvement in pattern completion in early childhood, so we're talking from age four to six here, may rely on the stronger communication between the hippocampus, which performs pattern completion, and the prior cortex, which may perform context detail read statements. Now, what about pattern separation? Uh, we're wondering whether children often mix up similar memories with each other. And what we've seen in a few different studies now is that there is also this increase in pattern separation performance from age four to eight, with the most consistent and pronounced age difference still between age four and six. So children are more often mistaking um, similar things with each other. So upon encountering this gray boat here, they would actually uh, falsely endorse that this is the same boat that they went kayaking with, for instance. And this is pretty remarkable um, how, how, how consistent they do this. Um, and, and this is a hallmark of pattern separation, right? But this catastrophic memory interference goes away by age six, so that's good. Now, when we measure uh, hippocampal subfield volumes in the same group of children, we found a gray matter volume of hippocampal subfields 
implicated in pattern separation outlined in blue here seems to track pattern separation performance. Uh, but in younger children, larger volume relates to better pattern separation, but in older children, um, smaller volume relates to better pattern separation. I think a lot more is needed to be done here uh, to understand this brain behavior association, especially in the longitudinal design. That's where it's probably needed the most. Nonetheless, these results do align with a general idea that cognitive development is accompanied by early uh, synaptic overgrowth, which is then followed by uh, selective pruning. Okay, so if you look at patterns completion and pattern separation together, they seem to follow a very similar age trend, right? They both go up in this. Uh, with age in this developmental window, which is probably unsurprising. What is surprising, though, is that if you uh, look at them together and measure them in the same kids, they are unrelated to each other within age. So if a given four-year-old is very good at pattern completion, it tells you almost nothing about how well they would do on pattern separation, even though these are both considered as episodic memory capacities. What this means is that, at least in my mind, um, by thinking about memory development through a computational framework, we are better able to uh, dissociate different facets of memory development. And from that standpoint, it buys you more specification compared to other classifications of memory systems, such as episodic versus semantic memory distinction, for instance. Okay, um, and now last but not least, how does generalization uh, develop across childhood? And we were also wondering how children create new knowledge. Do they draw on past instances to derive at this new knowledge? So most recently, we began to measure these three things together. Uh, we create a paradigm where they sh we show them events just like Susan going kayaking, skiing, hiking, and so on. And this was shown interspersed with other characters, by the way, like other characters might be interested in going to music festivals or something else. So there are these different um, categories. We then tested how well children appropriately generalize that Susan would want to go camping, given the option between going camping and going uh, to a music festival. And what we see is that generalization capacity goes up from age four to eight and much more steeply compared to pattern completion and pattern separation. So that's what happens when you, when we compare these slopes. And we found this to be really interesting because it hints at the possibility of a developmental lead lag between these processes. Um, that is, there is, there may be a developmental precedence of generalization over episodic memory early in life. And this might actually be a good thing that kids prioritize learning what generally happens first before they learn about the specific um, instances. Another insight that we got from studying these processes together is based on the finding that children and adults draw on different aspects of past episodes when they generalize. Um, what we found is that generalization success in adults, but not in children, is tethered to pattern completion of the individual episodes. And we take this as uh, the initial evidence um, that generalization can occur via multiple routes and that the contingency or the interaction between these processes may vary across development. Okay. Through the lens of these complementary neural computations, we have a framework for charting the multivariate profile of memory development, um, which I think is really exciting because these things are usually studied in isolation. But I do think that they have to be studied together because they do interact a lot. Um, and I think this can add to the existing taxonomy or classification that people have been talking about memory, such as episodic and semantic, uh, something that I've mentioned, or an older framework, explicit versus implicit memory, but it's still a very influential framework in thinking about memory development. I think it also helps us generate predictions of what kinds of memory failure should, as should associate with which underdeveloped process based on what we know about their neurobiological basis. This framework also provides a potential me mechanism for understanding um, memory impairments associated with different pathologies. So for instance, it has been suggested that in uh, typical and atypical aging, there is a decrease in pattern separation capacity, which biases the system towards pattern completion, even though it's suboptimal or even maladaptive to do, do, to do so. 
And similar ideas have been applied to mood-related disorders, schizophrenia, uh, where there's a uh, pattern separation improvement. And I think this kind of models can be applied to developmental questions, not only to study typical developments, but also uh, it can help explain memory development in cases like developmental amnesia. And perhaps we can also generate predictions um, about the impact of chronic stress associated with early life adversity on hippocampal and memory development. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank my PhD mentors, Nora Newcomb and Ingrid Olsen, and my current postdoc mentors, uh, Marcus Becker-Bevna and Uman Lindberger with collaborators and funders. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Zoe. Um, so without any sort of break, we're going to lead on to the next speaker. I think there's some interesting connection actually between what Zoe's been speaking about and what Matt is going to speak about, uh, and I'll leave that to Matt to sort of perhaps draw out. Uh, Matt is currently a PhD student, uh, just about to submit. Uh, he's a Wellcome Trust Clinical PhD fellow, and he's also a psychiatrist. And appropriately enough, his um, work, his most recent work has been on schizophrenia. So Matt, without further ado, over to you. Thanks, Ray. Um, I hope you can all hear and see my screen. If you can't, just let me know. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So thanks to Ray, Essie, Maya. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun to go last because um, I think that uh, th there, there are definitely points of overlap and it was uh, great, especially for Toby to give that very general overview. So um, I'm gonna speak at quite a high level as well, but like Zoe, going to go into some experimental findings. Uh, my work is in schizophrenia, as Ray mentioned, but I um, do believe that schizophrenia is highly relevant for people who are interested in brain development in child adolescent psychiatry, because as Toby pointed out, um, it, the, the initial psychotic symptoms tend to emerge in late adolescence, and even before this, there's almost certainly uh, a fairly long prodromal period in some people. And um, this likely has something to do with brain development or brain maturation in the frontal cortex to some extent. And we can talk about that uh, later if necessary. So I'm going to take a step back from um, psychiatry for a moment and uh, say that within, um, I guess, computational psychiatry, we're both uh, deeply invested in the idea that cognition has something to do with psychiatric phenomenology, but also that the brain has something to do with psychiatric phenomenology. And so the questions we're often asking are, what are the ways, what are the algorithmic ways that the brain has evolved to solve certain kinds of cognitive or computational problem? And how might these um, give rise to symptoms if, they're, uh, if they go awry? So the question that I'm particularly interested in is, uh, has to do with this question of cognitive mapping. And to give you an intuitive idea of what that's about, um, humans are remarkably good at representing the complex relationships in the world um, with relative ease and using relatively little experiential information. So for example, if you see a, a woman and a child together and given some kind of suggestive visual cues, you might with very little um, effort in make an inference that there is a kind of relationship, uh, a caregiving relationship between the two. And you've done this because you can leverage some abstracted model um, of how family structures tend to work. And this allows you to do interesting things like plan how you're going to get a present to the infant if you only have interaction with, with the woman. And if you were to see a man with the woman uh, time and time again, you may make an inferential leap that there's an association there between the man and the infant that um, you haven't actually directly observed. And that may well be correct or incorrect. And these, um, you can think, you know, it's kind of an abstract uh, idea here, but these knowledge structures involving people or events and their relationships, we call cognitive maps. And we can imagine how distortions of these representations might give rise to, for example, paranoia or certain delusional symptoms in psychosis. So how do we go about studying this? Um, well, we, we, we can make an analogy between these kind of knowledge structures, abstract knowledge structures in 
in uh, humans and the way that rodents and other animals represent physical space. Physical space also involves objects, you know, places and the relationships between them. So for example, in rodents, we know from a lot of work now that the hippocampus, the brain region that Zoe mentioned, is, uh, is intimately involved in the representation of physical space. When a rodent runs around an environment like this, there are cells within the hippocampus which fire for specific places, almost like a GPS system. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that when you observe uh, the rodent making a trip to a desired location, sometimes it can follow the exact path that it's followed before, but other times it can take shortcuts. It can make moves uh, that it hasn't experienced before um, or essentially make an inference about a relationship that it uh, simulates or speculates must exist but hasn't been directly experienced. And this is not so dissimilar um, from a computational perspective from making an inference that Homer must have a caregiving relationship towards Maggie in the previous slide. Um, so how does the brain do this? Well, we think that what the brain is doing at rest during sleep, during mind wandering probably has something to do with that. And if you look at rodents uh, when they are resting, when they're asleep, for example, you see something very interesting in the hippocampus, which is that every now and again, these uh, memories, these place cells get reactivated. And when they do so, they can sometimes replay memories that the rodent has experienced. Um, they just basically reactivate in a sequence. And now quite a lot of work in the rodent literature has shown that these resting state memory reactivations, these replay events, are very important for memory consolidation, but also potentially for planning, for simulation, for imagination. Essentially, if you disrupt them, the rodent does much worse when they're reintroduced into the environment. Um, so in, uh, in um, humans, we don't have the ability to go in and measure uh, brain recordings like this too easily. So we have to be a bit more creative and we use brain imaging. So I'm gonna present uh, briefly uh, an experiment we did over at UCL with, um, with Ray, uh, looking at these memory reactivations in a population of healthy volunteers, but also people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, where we think these hippocampal signatures may well be implicated. So the kind of task we do is we ask people to uh, learn the associations between pictures without um, having directly experienced all of the relevant associations. It's a bit like the Maggie Homer uh, Marge ex experiment. So if you observe that a padlock leads to uh, a plane and later observe that the rocket ship leads to the padlock, you can make an inference that the rocket ship is related to the plane without directly having observed that. And um, what we do is we ask people to perform this task. It's a bit more complicated than this. And then we ask them to sit quietly for five minutes resting, letting their mind wander. And because we're doing this in a brain scanning environment using MEG, we can actually get recordings of the brain activity while they're resting. And we have very high resolution recordings. Many, many hundreds of times a second, we're getting snapshots of the brain. And um, we can now ask the question, what's going on in this rest period? Are memories being reactivated? And the way we do this is a little bit technical, but just to give you a flavor for it, we combine the brain data that we record during the rest period with um, picture decoders. These are fingerprints of what the brain activity looks like for every picture that they've seen in the task. Um, and using uh, this approach, we can now decode what's going on at every time sample in the rest data. We can ask the question at this time sample T, is memory A being reactivated or is it B, C or D? And if those reactivations occur in a sequence, as you can see by this diagonal line, then we get a nice bump on this graph, which shows that there is memory replay um, happening at that speed. So that's what that graph means. If you see a bump, it means that memory replay is happening during rest. And um, just to uh, kind of show you our main finding, which was published just a few months ago, that in a sample of healthy volunteers, we indeed see this bump in, uh, in the rest data. And um, it's happening uh, at a very fast time scale. So memories are being reactivated within one second. Um, but in our 
people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, we, we didn't see the signature. And this didn't surprise us too much because we know that there's a, a rodent model, a genetic model, mouse model of, of the disorder, which also shows the same uh, replay impairment. But we were quite excited because this uh, work is the first time we've been able to translate that finding into a, into a clinical sample. Um, and this difference was significant between the, between the two groups and also related to all kinds of cognitive measures to do with learning. Um, I guess just time for a couple more data points that we, for those of you who are familiar with this literature, you'll know that replay events in the rodents occur in the context of very high frequency ripple bursts. So if you, the brain waves um, start oscillating at 100 times a second. And we also showed that this high frequency burst was there in our um, participants, uh, that it localized to the hippocampus, this region that Zoe was mentioning, and that it actually was greater in the patient population, again, convergent with the, um, the, the rodent model I mentioned before. Um, now, if you go to the paper, you'll see there's lots of other findings we go into that I, I won't go into now to do with um, building sort of neural maps and, and uh, behavioral measures, uh, which I think um, help to bolster um, uh, the kind of findings here. So I'm just going to skip this one slide where some of that is written. And just in my last minute, just to uh, just to talk about the implications. I mean, I think this has broad implications for cognitive neuroscience and for functional brain imaging. But what about beyond that? Because this is a slightly more diverse seminar. Um, now, I think that within cognitive neuroscience, we do need to do more to validate the reliability of our markers, our brain markers, our, our cognitive our behavioral markers. And if they turn out to be reliable and robust, then they could potentially be used for prognostication, for, for brain-based biomarkers. Um, I do think this kind of approach does have implications for cognitive neuroscience more broadly, as I, as I mentioned, and as a translational bridge between human um, and animal neuroscience. But I think for you guys, one thing is interesting is that new hardware developments now mean that we can potentially do similar experiments uh, in a much more easy way in children because people can move around and it's much less obtrusive. Um, where I think we can learn from the epidemiologists among you uh, is in your uh, quite sort of, um, you know, you, you're perhaps a lot more skilled at uh, deconfounding results because of your large sample sizes. And perhaps that's something that we, we can talk about towards the end. But uh, without further ado, just to thank my funders, uh, particularly thank Ray, who's my primary supervisor, uh, but also Yun Se Liu, who um, co-led this project. Thank you. Great, Matt, thank you very much. And thank you to the three speakers. Without further ado, I'll now hand over to Gemma for the discussion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so thanks to all of those uh, speakers for the really interesting talk. So I'm going to add the perspective of an epidemiologist. So I'll just briefly say that epidemiology mostly works with large samples, and we often aim to inform public health interventions in the general population, as well as clinical practice. And epidemiology has quite a long history of, of focusing on ways to strengthen causal inferences in observational data and and part of that has been developing methods to adjust for, for confounders, as, as Matthew just said at the end. I think that one thing that, you know, epidemi epidemiology could definitely learn from, from computational psychiatry and, and, and collaborate on going, going forward is, is in identifying mechanisms. So obviously cognitive and, and biological mechanisms, which, which is not something that epidemiology has generally tended to do. And, I also think that you know there's a lot of measurement error always in in these forms of research, but I think what computational psychiatry approaches offer is uh, perhaps a more objective form of measurement, which could potentially reduce measurement error. So one, I'm going to just pose a general question and then and then a question for each speaker. So one general question I have is, you know, in order to build on on collaborations between epidemiology and computational psychiatry how could we embed computational approaches into large longitudinal population-based samples? I'll also just uh, name us a, a specific question for each speaker. So, so 
Tobias spoke about the importance of improving our understanding of, of the etiology of mental health problems, which, which I'm sure a few people would, would disagree with. And you pointed out, Tobias, the, um, the start, the, the, the fact, you know, the well-established finding that most mental health problems start in adolescence. And, you know, you were proposing hypotheses about, about brain development. I wonder, Tobias, what, where you thought the role of the social environment during development fits in with your approaches and your hypotheses, and also how your findings would translate to a sort of public health preventative pro approach within the general population. And would that informing of prevention focus on targeting neural mechanisms or behavioral or the social environment as well? I don't know, Ray, shall I, shall I go to the speaker to answer and then ask my other question? Yeah, go. Tobias, do you want to go ahead? Yes, of course. Um, okay, three questions, I think. Yeah. Um, let me let me address the first one first about how we can bring those together. Um, and I think, well, the obvious answer would be using. So, so one of the challenges is to use these um, large scale neuroimaging studies. Um, or tasks like Matthew has talked about are rather challenging and often um, involve huge costs. And so for the big samples that, that ep epidemiological studies are running, that might be quite challenging. Um, I presented data from one sample in the NSBN where uh, we actually did that, which was a, a, a tremendous effort, effort and um, associated with huge costs. And uh, an alternative would be to use proxies of brain function or like uh, more the tasks that I presented, which are much easier, much easier to administer. Um, and the ways we've we're currently going forward, such as using these smartphone apps would actually be probably the, the most meaningful and easiest way because it's very easy to roll them out and to collect large samples um, and, and embed them in other studies. So I think that that would be my um most direct answer to that now um the second question was can you just give me a pointer again yeah so it was about uh, it was about like what your thoughts on on the role of the social environment oh and social yes yeah, sorry um yeah so i think i think this is very un this is still hugely underexplored so one of the disadvantages or limitations of, of tradition, traditional competition psychiatry is that we kind of tend to ignore everything around um, and the whole environment that someone is coming from. Um, in the best case, we control for what we call socioeconomic status um, and we try to account for and we kind of try to dis distillate the one thing. Probably not the right approach. I think um, there are two answers to that. So first of all, people are looking at social functioning um, using computational tasks. So people like Michael Motusis, for example, has done a lot of work on trying to capture difficulties in social interactions uh, in, in a more computational approach. And the other, the other thing that, that needs to be said is if, if, if social contributions contribute to, to mental health issues those are all rep also represented in the brain and therefore um this should be reflected in in maybe one way or another if we look at brain functioning um and then i think you have the last question about how this could be used for prevention um which is still a very much open question i think there are different approaches so for example if we could identify a specific mechanism which might be going wrong um, or which is about to to derail someone's trajectory into mental health problems we could intervene early and have kind of preventative intervention be it cognitive trainings if they work or other kinds of identifying um, people at risk and that's essentially what um, schizophrenia, the research in schizophrenia is doing with prodromal syndromes, where they were trying, where they're trying to um, find out who's at risk and then pre um, 
offer them the support before a diagnosis really um, hits the, the patient. Thanks to Tobias. Yeah, that, that, that was really interesting. Thank you. So, so interventions kind of more on an individual basis in terms of cognitive training and stuff. Yes, exactly. Um, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so so I just had a couple of questions for Zoe. So perhaps I'll so so Zoe, you showed us some some really um, beautiful and engaging tasks that can be used to assess memory development in young people. And you touched upon this just towards the end of your talk, Zoe, but I wondered if I could ask a little bit more about, I know you're not a mental health researcher, but have you thought about or developed any hypotheses about how your findings might specifically relate to uh, the causes or the characteristics of mental health problems? Yeah. Um... I, you're right that I don't work directly in mental health as much, but I do think a lot about individual differences, um, just because that that is what we see in younger children, uh, with even within the same age, that they vary among themselves quite a bit. And that is really nice because it gives us an opportunity into looking at what kind of things like brain structure or even home environment or school environment that may track these individual differences. And I think this could be the interface between the kind of work that we do and perhaps implications into mental health issues because it does provide a link as to what could or could not have an impact on what facets of learning and memory development. So for instance, um, something that I think about a lot is, um, is um, what the people call maternal reminiscing, which is how much parents talk to their children about what had just happened today or last week and things like that. And we see this memory boost in these very young children. So does that, that's of course, um, they've shown this correlationally and in a more, you know, pre-post kind of uh, intervention, if you can call it that kind of treatment. And it um, it shows to a work so far in very young kids, we're talking about like three to five year olds. Um, so that's definitely something that potentially could be an avenue where we see that memory development, especially for the memory specificity kind um, to not follow a normative uh, developmental trajectory. Um, chronic stress is something that I also think about a lot uh, in terms because of its special impact on on the hippocampus, right? So, and we know the implications of the hippocampus in what kinds of memory. So there, there I also think um, about intervention of what the group of children that could be a, um, could be exposed to early life adversity and what we can do in terms of boosting um, their perhaps tendency to overgeneralize that could have implications overall uh, down the line for like mood related disorders. So that's where I see those links exist. Thank you, Sue, that's, that's really interesting. And shall I just ask you to briefly comment on, have you, have you used your tasks in any large longitudinal studies or do you have plans to do that? And would they be sort of amenable to that approach? That's exactly what I'm here at Max Planck to do in my postdoc is to, I think that's the only way to study change. Uh, and so, you know, taking these snapshots is really nice and it, it helps us hone in in, our, in terms of hypotheses, predictions and, and so on. But tracking changes over time and potentially densely, uh, that would be really nice. As you see that a lot of things it seems to be a, like a really action packed period, right? I'm talking about early childhood here from age four to six, a lot of things are happening. So I'm imagining a research program where we track performances uh, in this multivariate fashion in something like classroom using uh, EdTech and, uh, and those things to, to link what we see as well as in the, in the wild, um, longitudinally and densely. That's, that's uh, the plan as of now. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, so uh, Matthew, so you, you spoke about really interesting uh, stuff about the cognitive characteristics of, of, of schizophrenia, which I'm sure everyone agrees we need, need to know more about, particularly at the biological level. I wondered what you thought about how your findings fit into the wider context of what we know about the cognitive characteristics of schizophrenia. And also, yeah, you mentioned confounding factors. So perhaps I'll ask you to expand a bit on that. So do you have any ideas about 
things that, that could confound those associations and things you want to take account of and how? Yeah, that's great. So I think um, a lot of work has been done on um, cognition and schizophrenia. Um, one line of that work has to do with inference impairments. So if you, um, one particular type of inference is something called transitive inference. So if you observe that, uh, you know, you like Jane more than you like Bob, and you like Bob more than you like Jill, then you should like Jane more than you like Jill. Some those kind of inferences um, uh, require the hippocampus. So there has been some early work in the late 90s showing that hippocampal damage in, in rodents impairs those kind of inferences. And um, there's uh, a fair amount of work now, much of it from UCL, not, not from me, from Rick Adams, for example, showing that people with the diagnosis also have those kind of inference deficits. Um, and this ties into a much broader literature which implicates the hippocampus as um, a site of potential uh, neural um, dysfunction, both from a receptor level to a, a gray matter density to, to hyperactivity at rest. So I think the results do fit in quite nicely with, with that. I think a slightly more um, pertinent question is the specificity of those findings. So schizophrenia is not the only condition which hippocamp the hippocampus is implicated in. Um, dementias are an entire uh, you know, broad spectrum of disorders which implicate the hippocampus, but also uh, Zoe mentioned sort of stress-related hippocampal damage in affective disorders, stress disorders, so uh, neurotic disorders, sorry. So there is um, a specificity question. Um, it's one thing showing that we have a case control difference. It's quite another showing that this is specific to our particular uh, diagnostic group. And in terms of how you could approach that experimentally, um, one approach is simply to include additional clinical groups within a study to see if those clinical control groups um, also show the, the, um, the, the, the change that you observe. But to go to your second question about confounders, I think this is a I think this is a, a deep uh, issue within case control, small sample size case control, cross-sectional designs like the one that I presented, where you can do your best to try and match your two groups on all kinds of potential measured confounders, age, educational attainment, paternal and maternal educational sort of status, and all the things that you will know far more about than, than we will. But there still might exist confounders which you simply haven't measured or haven't measured well enough. So I think um, uh, there are, um, you know, I, I would not say that the results that we present are definitely free of confounders. In fact, I would say the opposite, that more work needs to be done, longitudinal work, um, interventional work in, in preclinical sphere, which um, really teases apart which of these associations are correlational, which are a potentially common cause, etc. Um, there's no easy solution there because these brain imaging studies do, uh, I mean, they involve multiple hours with each participant. So, but we should be mindful of them, yeah, yeah, of these issues. That's brilliant, thank you. And um, so I don't know how we're doing for time. I think, shall I hand back to Rain so if you have any time for questions? There's a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Yeah, um, we have still uh, 15 minutes to go. Um, it'd be very interesting um, to know if, uh, in fact, Matt, you've taken a question there um, and responded to it. Do you want to just share that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Because I couldn't um, see the question. It seemed like a very interesting. No, it's an interesting question. Um, it's one which is highly relevant. Uh, the question is whether we uh, found any correlation to symptoms. And I guess actually, this might be something that Toby wants to jump in on as well in his own clinical work, but sometimes you find an interesting um, behavioral or even neurocognitive measure that differs between groups, and but, but yet you don't find that it correlates with a conventional symptom scale. Um, in our case, we didn't find that our neural measure correlated with symptoms. And I, in the chat, said that one, a couple of reasons for this, but one of them is to do with small sample size, one of them is to do with relatively well patient cohorts. But a slightly more interesting discussion is um, 
the fact that the symptom measures that we use clinically also have a very high variance and a very high inter-rater variance especially. So um, uh, the fact that we don't find a correlation with symptoms um, doesn't worry me too much in a sample size as small as ours, but if a sample size was 200 patients, it may well call, call into question the sort of predictive validity of what we're measuring in the, in the scanner. Toby, do you have anything to add on, on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a challenging, like, so the two points that Matt pointed out, small sample sizes, which is obviously not powered for finding uh, differences within the group, and the other um, is the, the measurement noise in, in both um, might explain. Um, but there's a more fundamental thing that, that we might need to consider because what essentially if we want to see a correlation between symptom severity and a certain neural measure like Matt, the, the, what, what does that actually mean? There is kind of an implication that probably if some process in the brain is more damaged, you're more ill, but this could could just totally not be. It could be that there is a process happening in the brain which is going awry, which is triggering um, a certain thought pattern, certain behavioral patterns, certain challenges, which per se doesn't need to be a clinical, clinically relevant, but then if we add stress, if we add different um, environmental stresses to it, then that could be driving the, the symptom severity. So, it has symptom severity is essentially a, a product of lots of different influences and the brain is just one contributor. If you don't have a family which is looking after you, you're, you have a bigger problem, right? And, and your sim symptoms will be worse. If you are well off, then your family is probably supporting you in finding treatment outside of the NHS and that will lower your symptoms. Um, so there are lots of, of um, things that play into symptom severity, which is a very global measure. It might be slightly different to what I presented on where we have a specific, assessing a specific symptom clinically, like let's say indecisiveness, and we measure that, where we are much more close conceptually also um, on, on a certain um, entity, which, which might give better associations. I think there's a related question in the chat, in fact. Uh, it's really directed uh, to Tobias. So it says, do you think more task-based measures, information gathering to capture symptoms like indecisiveness, could, should be used in the clinical setting for early diagnosis? So this is, again, related question. So... Um... The evident answer would be yes, of course, and, and it will make everything much better, but I don't think that. Um, I think it's much more challenging. So, so the, the question is, what, what, the, what are we actually after? And as we, if we're still, and then that goes back to the first statement that I had, that the psychiatric disorders, as we, as we see them, they are fantastic um, in, in many aspects, but they're probably not very biologically plausible um, if we think about biological mechanism. And so if we want to use these tasks to diagnose the depression, I think we're just not very well suited to do so because we can't just diagnose the depression by using our clinical like, depression measures. Why would I replace a PHQ-9 or whatever by a, a, a much longer task battery which measures something worse? I think if we were to have treatments that allow us to go into a specific deficit, um, be it cognitive and neurobiological, and if we can measure that using the ta specific task much better, then we need um, these tasks. But at the moment, we our tasks are still like, if we look at the effect sizes, we can't even tell apart patients well enough. So we can't even use our tasks to replace the, the much easier questionnaires or clinic interviews. So I guess a related question there, Toby, is the fact that, uh, of course, the tasks are looking to probe mechanisms. Diagnoses are sort of 
in a way, clinical conveniences because it enables you to have interventions to help people who are often in distress. Um, so do you think that the tasks could, however, be leveraged to come up with alternatives to con conventional diagnosis? We must, just, under the assumption that our diagnosis at the best, lump things together that will, on average, respond to intervention A versus intervention B. Um, do you think that the use of these tasks might, might push? Yeah. I think I think there are two ways where tasks could be really helpful and be well integrated within the what we have conventionally. So one is to start looking at defining subgroups within what we call one disorder um, and kind of see whether we can specify more specific profiles of patients and that we can tease apart and then we can see whether this might be relevant. And that leads to the second point where we could use tasks to predict treatment outcomes. So um, see whether we can use these tasks in order to predict which patient should receive which treatment um, and work by Quentin News and uh, for example, has shown that there is promise where they show that certain tasks help predict relapse after discontinuation of SSRIs. So there is a direct benefit of it. Um, and I think that's where we should start using these tasks. Okay, now there's a question that I want to put to Zoe. Um, I'm just trying to find it in the chat. Uh, oh yeah. So uh, is there any study about the, and I think you may have addressed it in the chat, but just to bring it out more generally, about the impact of toxic stress in memory and overgeneralization. And I assume that the question is really, toxic stress very early on in, 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 uh, in development and how it might impact upon um, generalization. Yeah, toxic stress. I mean, I actually assume that there has to be work that exists. I know of work that's looked at chronic stress exposure early on, so maybe age four, the early childhood. Um, and I mentioned in a chat where I'm talking, I'm men um, I mentioned um, uh, Martha Farah, Alison Mackey, um, and Tracy Riggins. Some of these are some of the researchers I've looked at this. Um, I do want to mention, though, that th that their memory essay is pretty coarse because usually people do one kind of task you remember this name with the space you know or these two words that appear together and it doesn't give us a lot of specificity into what aspect of memory that might be involved uh, in chronic stress or early life adversity so what i think uh, and this is something that i've pushed on a lot is that if we get these if we think about memory development from these processes and design our tasks accordingly, uh, it's going to get us to think about the biases of generalization and pattern separation much more clearer than the current kind of task batteries that we keep using um, for many decades. So, and we actually, one thing I wanted to mention is that it doesn't just seems to impact the hippocampus in diff across different subfields differently, which is uh, also another insight as to uh, what we think is that the, the aspects of mem memory specificity, like pattern separation, is especially impacted by chronic stress. So it's not all aspects of, of memory, but there are some specific impairments there. Yeah. And uh, early on, you did speak about pattern completion being CA1, CA2. CA3 to CA1. I think there are people still fight over this. <laughs> I think the idea is that CA3 could do pattern separation or pattern completion, depending on how much has been separated upstream from dentate gyrus. Um, but CA1 is where CA3 projects to where it kind of bring the complete quote unquote representations together. So I think it's, it's between those to subfields but you know there are other aspects that's why i don't i don't want to be i don't want to seem so hippocampus centric um i'm just looking at any other question here in the chat um yeah i can't see anything at, at the moment we're down to our last four minutes is there anybody who's got 
something um, they want to ask directly. Um, if not, uh, Gemma, do you have? Do you want to have a last word on? Um, yeah, sure. There, there is a question I've spotted from Essie. Do you want me to ask that, or shall? Do yeah. Probably... yeah. Um, Essie asked, "Do the speakers see the utility of these approaches in the area of developmental psychology as biomarkers for prediction, or as biomarkers for prevention or treatment response?" Perhaps just a quick response from each speaker, and then I can wrap up. Okay, um, Mark, do you want to have a have a crack at this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, one of the things that I mentioned in my last slide is I, I do think. So it might sound a bit boring, but I do think we need to validate uh, the reliability, the test retest reliability of these measures, um, and that is hard work to do, and it's work that the field in general needs to do. But, one, but I think that one of the exciting things about not, not just the behavioral stuff that Toby was presenting, but also the kind of more neural markers is that some of these are proposed to pick up on cognitive, neurocognitive mechanisms that are generative of symptoms later down the line. So they should lead, they should appear before symptom appearance. And I think that there are loads of conditions where that may be really quite helpful. So in the case of schizophrenia, which is my clinical interest, by the time somebody has, is, is having a, a psychotic episode and has been admitted to hospital, they may well be in the final years of their exams at school. They may well have um, down, several relationships may well have, have suffered because of that. And so it's not just simply, oh, we have drugs which can dampen down positive psychotic symptoms. It's more, um, you know, there are, many of the problems that this individual will have will, will still be around once those symptoms have been treated. So I think that, yeah, I am, we are, I am very hopeful that uh, this approach will help with prognostication and psychotherapeutic development, but um, we need to validate the biomarkers first. And that's something which, uh, yeah, is going to take work. Can I just ask a small follow-up question? I think I wonder to what degree you think that, especially this sort of, if we want to try and take a more preventative approach, we need to also think more multifactorially. So taking any of these sorts of probes together with perhaps a number of other probes and also perhaps some social markers. Because when you think about complex disorders, it's very unlikely to my mind that a single domain is going to explain all of the all of the risks. So to what extent do you think in addition to kind of validating the measures, we need to also get better at doing um, doing multivariate studies thinking in, in a multivariate framework? Yeah, you, you won't get any pushback from me on that. I think that's, that's, that's definitely true. Um, I may be wrong in this, but a distant memory is that even identical, genetically identical twins, um, exactly. if one individual develops schizophrenia, the other individual does not have a hundred percent chance. I think it, it's probably on the order of fifty to seventy percent. So there's a lot going on, um, especially when we're talking about belief formation and social cognition. And um, yeah, I think Toby answered that really quite well as well. Like, uh, yeah, your resilience. Yeah, exactly. I'll stop there, I guess. So I just um, just make the, the, a final comment, which is I thought it'd be nice just to end on a, a note about um, cross disciplinary collaboration. And I think, you know, we've all emphasized what we're interested in and what our strengths are, but also, you know, the commonalities about um, improving our understanding of the etiology of mental health problems to inform prevention and also biomarkers and characteristics to inform uh, treatment. So I think yeah, cross-disciplinary collaboration is um, a really important future direction that perhaps isn't, isn't happening enough right now and could happen more. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, well, I think we, we're sort of on that very constructive note, which is sort of reflects the sort of the, the whole general ethos behind the Catalyst seminars. I just want to finish by thanking each of the speakers, Matt, Zoe, Tobias. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Gemma. And of course, Essie, thank you for having the great imagination to put this really exciting series together. <laughs>
and all the best. Um, stay safe and see you all soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.